So uh, before I begin with the message this morning, I do want to say thank you for all of you who sent through cards and uh, notes uh, over the last month for pastor appreciation. Uh, we consider it an honor and a privilege to be able to serve God by serving you. And those notes and those cards just reminded us that uh, sometimes even things we didn't notice really made a difference. And so we're very grateful for that. And uh, thank you so much for your generosity as well. Um, we're, we're working through a series called Surprised by Grace. When you think of the life of Moses, you tend to think of law and you tend to think of judgment. And when you examine the life of Moses, what you discover is it's just saturated with examples of grace. And so we're taking uh, two months where we're looking through the life of Moses. And today we come to one of those stories that if you've been around Christian environments at all, even as a child, you probably heard this story, and it's the crossing of the Red Sea. It's one of the great miracles in all of human history, and in fact, was one of the standout miracles in the Old Testament, and one of the most referred to miracles in all of Scripture. So we're going to take a few minutes to look at that today. We're in Exodus chapter 14, and it says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Why have you done this by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. It's interesting. He's diagnosed what it is that's driving their language and their frustration. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through the chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I, the Lord, when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. And throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side, that's the Egyptian side, and light to the other side, that's the Israelite side, so that neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through on the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariots so that they had difficulty driving, and the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. 
That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. That's a great story. It really is. Uh, Israel had their first day off in any of their living memories. They've been slaves for as much as four centuries. No days off, no holidays, just tasks. And if you didn't complete them in the appropriate time, a penalty, a punishment, pain would come your way. And so they actually have a day when they're, they're walking and, and they're free. And this is how we tend to think, isn't it? I'm free if I don't have anything to do. Is that our definition of freedom? Or I'm free if no one's telling me what to do. Is that our definition of freedom? Well, it's interesting that the route that they were taking was not the shortest route to get them to the place that God intended them to go. And we are told in the previous chapter that he picked this route on purpose because if they took the shortest route, they were going to have to face the Philistines. And the Philistines were war tribes. Like they were, they were very skilled in battle. And so God knew that if the Israelites faced war right away, they would just flee back to Egypt and go right back into slavery again. And so God didn't lead them that way. There's another way that they could have gone, and God didn't lead them that way either. And that's there were a, a number of defense forts put up by the Egyptians to protect them from their neighbors. Egypt was the greatest military power in the world at that time, but the way you stay the greatest military power is that you protect yourself against potential enemies. And so they didn't go that way either. And so what happens is they wind up going down by the Red Sea, or some historians believe that the sea that they went down by is called the Sea of Reeds, and that the, it's been translated the Red Sea. And, and there are some people who get frustrated by that, and they say, well, is that saying that it's not a miracle? No, that's not, not the point. Say, well, maybe it was a smaller sea and, and the children of Israel just waded across. Okay, so how did all the Egyptians die in knee-deep water? So it's not really about that. And so what we see is God leads them, and what happens is they're kind of backed up to the sea and the desert around them, and there's no way out. And, and Pharaoh thinks a couple of thoughts here, and his thought is, these people do not know what they are doing. And the second thought has to do with his loss. He begins to calculate the incredible economic loss to the nation of Egypt by letting this slave labor go. And he also begins to calculate what it's going to do to his reputation. He'll be known as the Pharaoh that lets slaves walk out of the country. And the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And a lot of us interpret that to mean as though God made Pharaoh do something he didn't want to do. When God hardens someone's heart, he's not changing their will, he's reinforcing it. He's giving them the courage to do what's already in their heart. Pharaoh never wanted to let them go. And now that he sees them in a defenseless position, he's pretty sure he's going to do something about it. Pharaoh didn't change his mind. He just found new courage to act in the way that he always thought about acting. No. Israel, they've got no slave drivers. They've got no taskmasters. They've got no whips. They've got no chains. They've got no problems, right? Until they look up and they see the Egyptian army and chariots. And to us, this might not seem that big a deal, but chariots is a really big deal in the ancient world. It was, they were death machines is what they were. Drawn by horses, they could outpace humans' capacity to escape. And there were usually two people in the chariot, one that would drive the chariot and the other one that would have a sword or a spear, a javelin, and, that, and, and they were the ones that would enact the pain and the penalty of death upon their enemies. It was considered modern technology back in that day. It would be the equivalent of you waking up and walking out in the morning and seeing hundreds of tanks rolling down the streets of your city from an enemy. And so they're absolutely terrified. They had been so happy just moments before, 
And now they're stricken with terror. They're paralyzed by fear. And what it reveals is that they're still slaves. They, they don't have someone with a whip over top of them, but something is going on inside of them. One single overwhelming situation and they were ready to go back to bondage. That's what they told Moses. We told you we should have stayed there. We should go back. There's one person in this whole exchange who doesn't act this way, and it's Moses. Moses doesn't seem to be stricken with fear. He doesn't seem to be paralyzed by terror. He, he's not saying the same things everyone else is saying. In fact, what he's saying is just hold still. Be quiet. God is going to help us today. Why was Moses like this? And this is what some of us think. Some of us think it's because he was just a better person. He's just a gifted leader. He has a stronger will. He's more courageous. He's braver than the rest of us. He's the guy that we make movies about. When everybody else is running, they stand there with their cuts and their bruises and bleeding and barely weaponized at all against an insurmountable enemy, and they stand there and they're going to exact their vengeance upon them. This is how we tend to see Moses. And that's not what's going on at all. That's not who Moses is. The reason Moses is able to stand in that moment and sound different than everybody else is because he has spent time with God and he is a servant of God. He hasn't just heard about the good things that God has done. He didn't just see something that looked like a miracle. He's learned how to walk in obedience to God. And that's a game changer. See, Moses is not just free from Pharaoh's authority. Moses is under God's authority. And there's the difference. Everybody else has defined freedom as I don't have to do the work I don't want to do today. And if that's your definition of freedom, I have some really bad news for you today. You're in for a lot of fear. If your goal in life is just to be the person who calls your own shots and nobody ever tells you what to do, it sounds great. And sometimes it even feels great until something happens that's bigger than you. And then what? And because Moses is a servant of God, he knew lots of things were bigger than him, but he knew nothing was bigger than God. That's the difference. So Israel had been walking out, everything felt good, and now all of a sudden they're paralyzed by fear. And here's the point I want you to see this morning, and that is fear is a form of slavery. Fear is a form of slavery. There are things you will not do because you are afraid. I was in high school and I was in a math class and math was not my strong suit. It would be an exaggeration to say that any of my classes were a strong suit. But as far as classes went, this was at the bottom of the heap and, and the teacher said to me, he said, I want you to go up and here's the problem. It's written on the board and I want you to solve it in front of everyone. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I do not know how to solve that problem. And he said, well, Mr. Reeves, you are going to go to the front of the room and you are going to stand there and we are going to wait until you solve the problem. And so I went to the front of the room and I took the chalk in my hand and I stood at the blackboard for those of you who don't know what that is, that's a temporary writing implement that <laughs> they used to use in the ancient world right next to the cave paintings and drawings. <laughs> and I just stood there paralyzed because I didn't know the answer. I didn't know. And I knew if I tried to make one up, Everyone would just laugh hysterically. And so I just stood there. There are things we will not 
do. There are jobs we will not apply for. There are schools that we will not try to attend. There are, there are chains that are invisible, but they're very real. There are things we will not do, people we will not talk to, things we will not try. Why? We're afraid. Well, our culture just says you need more confidence in yourself. And that sounds really good. And don't get me wrong, confidence is a very attractive trait in anyone. In fact, we're attracted to people who act confidently. Often we can't tell the difference between confidence and arrogance, and so we're just even attracted to arrogance. We can't tell the difference between confidence and cockiness, so we're attracted to cockiness too. But if our confidence is in ourselves, or our confidence is in our friends, or our confidence is in our job, or our confidence is in our financial resources, then I can assure you that as soon as something is bigger than any of them comes into your life, you're going to be paralyzed by fear, and the chains you thought were not there will be revealed. We don't share our, the incredible, gracious gifts that God has poured into our lives with other people. We don't share our story of, of grace with other people. Why? If we like a restaurant that we went to, we'll tell other people about it. If we like a, a, a workout routine, routine that we thought benefited us, we'll tell other people about it. If we try to diet and we actually lost weight, we'll tell other people about it. But God has done these amazing things and. Why? There are times we want to be generous with other people. We actually have the resources. We have enough money in our pocket or at least our bank account. We could do something, but, but we don't. Why? Because we are afraid I might not have enough. We have time that we could use. We have talents and abilities that we could use, but we're afraid. There are conversations that need to be had, sometimes in our relationships, sometimes with our spouses, sometimes with our kids or our parents, our friends, work environments, neighborhoods. They're necessary conversations and we won't have them. Why? Because we're afraid. What are we afraid? Well, they'll, they'll, maybe they'll leave us. And so we wait until we hate. And then we say things that don't need to be said. Why didn't we say the things that could have been said? Well, we were afraid. Freedom is found in serving God. Freedom is found in serving God. Not known to be a particularly spiritual person, but as it turns out, uh, he said something very powerful. Uh, you may have heard of him. His name is Bob Dylan, and he said, you're going to serve somebody. And we do. We don't need to serve ourselves. We need to be saved from ourselves. And that's what this story reveals. People are focused on Pharaoh, but they're still slaves. And something needs to happen where people are saved from themselves. Egypt looks unbeatable, but one night and a strong east wind. And that entire military campaign is going to go down to defeat. Jesus would say this in John chapter 5, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Do you know what the Israelites felt? They felt the judgment of Pharaoh. They felt judged, and they were afraid because they had not yet crossed over. So have you crossed over? Are you no longer being judged? Or do you feel judged all the time? Pharaoh will wind up not destroying Israel, and it's not because Pharaoh is weak, and it's not because Israel is strong, it's because God is good. 
and his army is going to be defeated. So what caused that? Their salvation was because of what God did, and that's what our salvation is too. If we're constantly trying to earn our salvation, we're always going to feel intimidated. We're always going to face something. All a doctor has to say is the word we most fear. All a spouse has to say is the statement we most fear. All a child has to say is the statement we're most afraid of. And all of a sudden, our lives unravel. So, uh, how would you have crossed the Red Sea? Confidently? <laughs> or would you have been running as fast as your little feet could carry you because you don't know when these walls are going to come down again? <laughs> why, why does this matter? Because they weren't saved by how much confidence they had. Faith is not how much confidence you have. Faith is your obedience to God. And God just told them, walk across. And so some of them, probably very confident. Some of them, not so confident. Some of them terrified that they're going to drown. They're probably crying all along the way, I can't swim, I can't swim, I can't swim, I can't swim, <laughs> until they get to the other side. Right? Yeah. Don't confuse faith and feelings. Faith does not equal your confidence. Faith equals your obedience. And it doesn't matter whether your pace is running or a slow confidence stride. It doesn't matter whether tears are running down your face or your hands are sweating and your mouth is dry, your tongue is dry. None of that matters. What matters is obedience. And the nation of Israel trusted God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. So who are you trusting? Who are you trusting? Jesus is the one who died for us. He's the one who tells us that we can have life to the full. But if our definition of freedom and a full life is calling our own shots and doing whatever we want, wherever we want, with whoever we want, however we want, you're in for a rough ride. There are conversations we cannot control and situations we cannot control. Something will happen and it will remind you you're still a slave to fear. And this is not a message that, so if, if you ever get afraid, you haven't done it right. This is the message of when you get afraid to know who to listen to. And Moses, he knows who to listen to. Everybody be still, be quiet. God's with us. I know what you're seeing seems overwhelming, uncontrollable, undefeatable, impossible. God is with us. I don't know exactly how he's going to do it, but he's going to make a way. And he did. Through the night, they crossed through that sea and the waters came back over the Egyptian armies. And in the morning, washing up on the shore with the evidence of a victory that they played no part in, but they were saved just the same. I had no part in what Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. I did not create that way. And there have been moments when my fears have been greater than my confidences. But as long as I continue to follow the way he's called me to walk, I'm saved. I'm rescued. And he promises me a full life. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, thank you. You are the one who gives us victory. We don't have to be in slavery any longer, not because we are great or strong or capable, but we trust in you. 
as we put our trust in you this morning, would you begin to dissolve the chains that have been holding us back in life? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.